everyone. I'm glad you could join us tonight for our Bible study. This is the Meadowood Church of God Bible study, and uh, I'm happy to, to bring it to you tonight. I hope that you'll be blessed. Uh, once again, thanks for joining. Call some friends, text some folks, tell them to get online at the Meadowood Church of God uh, Facebook page, and let's study the Word together, okay? So right now what I'd like to do is just open in prayer. Uh, while we're doing this, I'd like, you know, if you'd like to add your prayer request in the comment section, we'll, we'll get those and we'll pray for you and pray with you. But let's just go to the Lord in prayer together, okay? God, I love you. I thank you. I praise your holy and mighty name. But Father, I pray, Lord, that you would just touch all the folks that are viewing tonight. God, that you would minister to them the word of truth. Bring hope. God, build the faith of your people. I pray, God, that we would just draw closer to you, that we learn more about who you are, what you mean to us. I pray for all the needs of the people, Father. Heal the sick, save the lost, deliver those who are in bondage. God, we just believe right now that you're going to move in the lives of everyone who sees or hears this video tonight. We give you praise and we give you honor for it all in Jesus' mighty and holy name. Amen. Well, I'm excited about this study tonight. I want to bring you some hope. Uh, I've been hearing a lot of negativity on the tele television and in the radio and even by other ministers of the gospel who are uh, seem to be very negative. And what I mean by that is um, very condemning. And I want you to know that there's hope for the believer. There's hope for the Christian. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, amen, you're in a win-win situation. Uh, so I want to talk to you tonight about your covenant. If you are a follower of Christ, if you're a born-again believer, you are in a covenant. And you're not just in any kind of covenant. You are in a blood covenant. I want to talk to you about that tonight. And I hope that this knowledge that you're in this covenant with God will bring you hope and will bring peace to you and your family. So let's begin this. Uh, now Israel was a nation that, that lived by and relied on their covenant with God. Those who knew their God and the integrity of their covenant with Him, they were mighty and they did great exploits in, the name, in His name. David, uh, King David, was a prime example of that. He... Uh, he, he credited his covenant with God as the power behind his ability to slay a lion and a bear and even the giant. In 1 Samuel 17, verses 26 through 37, we find David assuring King Saul that he was able to slay Goliath. The scripture says, uh, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? The Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. Circumcision was a sign of the covenant. And by calling Goliath uncircumcised, David was making a very pointed statement. He, he may be a giant, he may be strong, but he has no covenant with God and that's why I can kill him. So of course, you know the rest of the story. David bravely slew Goliath in the name of the Lord because of his covenant. The book of Hebrews promises that we have an even better covenant than David had. Our covenant has better promises. But to know exactly how much better they are, uh, we must understand what the promises of the Old Covenant were. You see, we, David lived in the Old Covenant. We live in the New Covenant, which was established by Jesus Christ. God established it with man, a man called Abraham. Uh, he promised to make Abraham the father of many nations. And he promised to give him a great deal of land as his inheritance so his descendants could live uh, peacefully for the rest of their lives. And in Deuteronomy 28, you will find more very specific promises that God made to Abraham's descendants. Promises of health, 
promises of well-being, of blessing, and of victory. These were very awesome promises. And it was hard for Abraham to believe that God actually wanted to do these things for him. In Genesis 15, we read how God made a blood agreement with Abram in order to convince Abram once and for all that he meant what he said. And Abram asked, How shall I know that I will inherit this land? The Lord answered by telling him to prepare for a blood covenant. He said in Genesis 15 verses 9 through 10, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid them each, peace one against the other. But the birds divided he not. See, in Abraham's day, or in Abram's day, the blood covenant signified an absolute, unbreakable guarantee of man's word. Nothing short of a blood agreement could have convinced Abram that God desired to bless him. By cutting the covenant with him, Almighty God communicated his unfailing love, his fidelity, on a level that Abram could understand. God was establishing a love relationship with him that could not be broken without the penalty of death. So in order to see just how that covenant compares to the one we have with the Father today, we need to see what the covenant of God cut with Abram involved. That way we can begin to see clearly why ours is even better. In Abram's society, when two families made a covenant together, they gave one another everything they had and all they represented. They were no longer two, but they became one. Families bound themselves together in blood agreements in order to fill the gaps created by each other's weaknesses and needs. Where the first tribe was strong, the second was weak. Where the second tribe was strong, the first was weak. Together, they were both strong. These two families drew, drew up terms of an agreement and discussed discussed them until to articles uh, each article was fully and mutually agreed upon and then they chose representatives and a place to cut the covenant and as they prepared for the solemn ceremony at least three large animals were sacrificed their carcasses were split down the spine and the halves were placed on the ground opposite each other the result was a trail of blood between the two halves. The path is called the way of blood. The way of blood. When the covenant ceremony began, the two representatives exchanged their coats. This signified a mutual exchange of authority. By this act, the covenant representatives were saying, All that I do, all that I have now is yours. The next covenant representatives exchanged their weapons. Though this, by this they were saying, My strength is now your strength. Your strength is now my strength. My enemies are your enemies, and your enemies are my enemies. After the coats and weapons were exchanged, then, they, then came the walk of blood. Twice the representatives walked through the way of blood, stopping in the center they were pronounced their pledges of loyalty making promises to each other that could never be broken this pronouncement was called the blessing of the covenant the curse was also pronounced the curse was the penalty of breaking the terms of the agreement they swore by their god thereby making him third party to the covenant Next came the cut of the covenant. The representatives cut their hands and wrists and bound their wrists together so that their blood would intermingle. 
After their loyalty was sworn to each other, the families joined their names together as a permanent sign that they had become one. Finally, they ate a covenant meal of bread and wine together. The bread signified their flesh. The wine signified their blood. The covenant meal represented their willingness to uh, commitment and to lay down their lives for each other. Such blood agreements were very serious in Abram's day. That is why God chose to make a covenant with him. He wanted to convince Abram that his promise was true. He wanted him to understand that the great El Shaddai desired an unbreakable relationship with him and with his children after him. God wanted Abram to know without a doubt that he loved him and he would care for him and because he had to. Because he had made a covenant with him. And he wanted to. God initiated the covenant. By making blood covenant with him, Almighty God proved that he wanted to exchange his strength, he wanted to exchange his weapons, and he wanted to exchange his authority with Abram. He proved that he wanted to bless man for a thousand generations. Romans 4, 21 tells us that Abram got the message. He became fully persuaded that God was able to perform that which he had promised and his life was, his life was never to be the same again. Even his very name was changed to Abraham, meaning father of many nations. And eventually Isaac, the long-awaited son of promise, was born to Abraham and his wife Sarah. Years after Isaac's birth, that covenant was still strong in Abraham's mind. And nothing, not even a request from God himself, could shake his confidence. We see this in Genesis 22. There God asked Abraham to place his only son on an altar of sacrifice. How could he do this after promising Abraham that he would become a father of many nations through this son? We would expect Abraham to be distraught over such a question. We would expect him to, to wring his hands and pace the floor all night in grief and anguish. But we're not as covenant-minded as Abraham was. Abraham was confident in his covenant. He went to sleep that night and arose early the next morning ready to go. And when he took Isaac up on the mountain of sacrifice, he turned his servant to his servant and he said, Wait here, the boy and I will come back. He had a covenant. Hebrews 11, 17 and 19 says that Abraham by faith had already received Isaac raised from the dead. God had promised him Isaac would, be, would make him the father of many nations and he knew God could not possibly break his promise. And even though he'd never seen or heard of such a thing, Abraham reason that God would just raise Isaac from the dead if he had to. He knew that God would do whatever it took to keep their covenant. And Abraham laid his son down on the altar of sacrifice. He opened the way for God, his covenant partner, to do the same thing with his only son, Jesus Christ, on the cross years later. But Here's an important point that you need to realize. Jesus didn't just appear on the scene at that time. He'd been involved in the covenant from the beginning. According to Genesis 3, I'm sorry, according to Galatians 3:16, while God was binding himself to covenant to Abraham on earth, he was also making covenant with Jesus in heaven. The scripture says now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made past tense he saith not un, and to seeds as of many but as of one 
to thy seed, which is Christ. See, Abraham, the earthly, he was the earthly representative, and Jesus was the he heavenly representative. And, and the covenant was not only between God and Abraham, but between God the Father and God the Son. And by making covenant with Jesus, he was making covenant with someone he knew would never break it. So thereby removing the need for a curse. So how does this apply to you and I today? Galatians 3.29 is the binding tie. It says, And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We are the unborn generations who looked on as God cut the covenant with Abram, the father of the covenant of faith. And Romans 8.17 calls us joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Though the, through the new covenant, uh, God was promised, he has promised to care for us the same way he would love and care for Jesus. This, this new covenant is better than the old. And if you read Deuteronomy 28, you'll find the blessings that are promised to those who keep the terms of the covenant. They're wonderful promises. It's hard to imagine any better promises. But keep reading and you'll find also the curse that will fall on those who break the agreement. That's where our covenant differs. Although we uh, ourselves have been guilty of breaking the terms of the covenant, we've been freed from the penalty of that. From the time Jesus was born until he died on Calvary, he never broke the terms of the covenant. Yet he went to the cross. He bore the curse or the penalty for breaking it. Why? So that you and I would never have to bear it. Galatians 3, 13 and 14 says, Christ hath, hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Praise the Lord. Every demonic and diabolical thing that can ever come against you during this lifetime was placed on Jesus when he went to the cross. He bore the penalty for your sin. He bore your sickness and he carried all of your diseases. He totally stripped the devil of his power to harm you. And he bore the curse for you so that you could receive the blessing of Abraham through faith in Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Jesus became the sacrificial lamb that established your covenant with God. His own blood was shed. And the book of Hebrews tells us, it says that we have a new living way, a new way to approach God. Remember the way of blood. Well, the blood of Jesus was, has made the way for us to have a covenant relationship with the Father. Jesus was not only a blood sacrifice, but he became our representative, the one mediator between God and man. 1 John 2 and 1 says, We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He not only sees our forgiveness when we confess our sins, he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Jesus was not only the blood sacrifice and the representative, he was also the covenant meal. He said in John 6, 51, I am the living bread which come down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I will give for life, the life of the world. You see, well, you, you need to understand the covenant terminology. Then you can see the thread of the covenant relationship woven all through the New Testament. Ephesians 6, 10 through 11 and 13 through 17. What a familiar passage of Scripture for the believer. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand the, in the evil day. Having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having your breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. 
above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praise the Lord. Jesus has exchanged his weapons and armor with you and made you strong in the power of his might. He has exchanged your weakness for his strength. Through a covenant relationship, you are now one with him. Jesus took your sin and gave you his robe of righteousness and right standing with God. He has become so totally one with you that he has given you his authority and his name. Mark 16, 17 says, And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. The devil has no right to interfere with your affairs. The new covenant does not depend on your ability to keep it. It depends on Jesus' ability to keep it. And he can keep a covenant. Just like Abraham, just like David, you have a covenant with the Almighty God. Just like Abraham, you can become fully persuaded that what God has promised you, he's able to perform. Just like David, you can stand on that covenant and whip any Goliath, any uncircumcised circumstance that stands in your way, no matter how big it looks. But your covenant is even better. It doesn't carry the curse anymore. Right now, read Deuteronomy 28, 16 through 68 in your Bible. That's a list of the curses Christ freed you from. Praise God. They include every diabolical thing the devil could ever use to destroy you. Read them and rejoice. Those are the things that God has healed you of and delivered you from. Praise God. Receive your deliverance. Jesus paid the price for it. He bore the curse. He became the covenant sacrifice for you. Proving once and for all just how intensely he desires to love and bless you. Let him do it right now. You'll love him all the more for it. If you don't know Jesus today, you can know him. If you'll confess him as Lord and Savior of your life, if you'll repent of your sins, if you believe on him, he will save you, he'll redeem you, make you a new creature in Christ. And you can be of this covenant that we're talking about. If you're not living for the Lord and you're not serving Him right now, I want to ask you to pray this prayer with me. The Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart. Will you do it? Father, I have sinned. I'm a sinner. I need salvation. I'm not living for you now. I want to. I want this covenant. I want this relationship, God. Lord, I ask you, forgive me of all my sin. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I confess it all to work to you, Lord. And God, I ask you just to forgive me and cleanse me. I believe, Jesus, you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross. And I believe you rose from the dead and took the punishment and the curse of sin upon yourself.